Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Christopher Maronga. Uh, I'm from Kenya. I'm also the co-organizer of a local R user group in Nairobi called Nairobi R. And uh, so today we are going to listen from um, uh, Masin, Masin Kosinski. So Masin has a master's degree in mathematical statistics with a specialty in data analysis and uh, is a love of R language. And uh, his past work has been in the field of uh, online learning and the various approaches to personalize news article recommendation. Uh, Masin is a great contributor to our community um, as, a, as an organizer of YR conferences, and uh, he has interest in developing our packages and uh, survival mo uh, models. So currently, uh, Masin is uh, exploring and improving uh, methods for quantitative meeting uh, uh, marketing analysis and global surveys at uh, graded metrics. So he's going to talk to us about uh, integrating R um, uh, on AWS, that Amazon Web Services, a very interesting topic. And uh, I hope you all enjoy. So I will let you know that uh, you can send in your questions in the chat box so that we can ask to the speaker at the end of the, of the presentation. And uh, under the video description, you will see a Zoom link that, uh, uh, that you, can, you can get Masin uh, one-on-one after the after the presentation so that you can talk to him or ask him any question that you might be having. So welcome, Masin, and uh, please take over and uh, 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 talk to us. Thank you, Christopher, for the kind introduction. I'm really happy that we have a diverse team and uh, we can have hosts from all over the world. Uh, so Nairobi R is really supporting us on, on this field. We will have Chris for this and uh, other two webinars. So I'm really glad to see what are people doing around the world with uh, our communities and with, uh, with our groups. So let me share the screen. Yes, so um, as Christopher mentioned, under the video in the description, you will be able to see a Zoom URL that's going to be a one-to-one one to one, a meeting after the webinar is done. I will be there. If you, are, if you have any other questions that are not solved during the webinar, you can join and we can, we can talk. Um, and also, you will be able to find the URL to all the materials uh, also in, in, the, in the description of the, of the video. I have just pushed the recent changes. So um, basically, I was trying to to find a proper, uh, a proper, let's call it consensus between making a presentation and putting together uh, useful materials. So in the end, I decided to drop the presentation and go with with the with the materials. So uh, during the talk, uh, you will have a chance to see a quick and small hands-on workshop. I will be talking about how you can use R on, w, on AWS, what AWS offers for our users and what's offered for data, data analysts. And uh, actually, this is the stuff that I would like to hear from an experienced person when I started working with AWS. It took me some time to realize uh, uh, drawbacks and benefits uh, of this platform, and I synthesize all the needed material materials into into one place um, and as you may know I'm a community manager for for a very long time so my R knowledge and skills are no longer up to date so please bear with me if I uh, do some silly 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 mistakes or have uh, not polished the code so okay so let's start. As a member of Wire Foundation, we were organizing meetups all over the Europe for the past couple of uh, months and years. You can see that we organized four our conferences. And uh, as a meetups and conferences, conferences organizer, I can tell that the worst thing you can do at your own conference or, your, or at your own meetup is to actually give a talk because you need to get prepared and you need to organize the meeting so keep that in mind and never be in that never be in that place where you need to give a talk at your own conference 
All right, so that's a quick table of contents for today. Uh, AWS is a very comprehensive platform that uh, provides almost 200 various services. But in my opinion, for the very for the very start, for a data scientist, the, the R user, we we need to know the first three most common services. One of them is S3, that's for the storage. The other one is the RDS, and that helps to create and connect to uh, relational data databases. And the third service is EC2, and that allows us for the cloud computing. This allows us to actually create a, a machine in the cloud and run computations in there. So those are the three services that I would like to, to cover today. And uh, yeah, I think that the hour will be enough. So to start with AWS, you will need to have an account. If you go to their website, you will be able to create a new account in the top right, in the top right corner. And uh, with that, you will be able to create an uh, I am user. That's a general, that's a general user name that will be built. And uh, within that user, you will be able to create to create uh, smaller usernames. So for example, there is one global username within which you can create uh, users and roles so that you can have one team working on the same account in the end, one, one billing account. So for example, I have created a, a username that that's how it would look like if I open if I open the console. I don't know if I'm already logged in or not. Okay, I'm logged in. So maybe let's check this out in the incognito mode. Ready? You need to provide the password. So that's the general account ID. Then you have the smaller username and uh, provide a password. And you're logged in. So now what we are seeing is uh, the management console. From that console, you are able to access uh, all the services. And the recently visited are also visited on the top. So today I will talk about S3, that is for data storage, RES, that is for connection with data databases, and EC2, that's for the cloud computing. And there's also an IAM panel where you can create other smaller users within your, your account. Uh, if you would like to read a bit more about all those services, so in the README, I also put uh, URLs with, uh, with the landing pages for all the services. All right, so let's start with uh, AWS S3. That stands for Simple Storage Service. And it allows you to store various types of objects uh, in the cloud. And uh, there are many, uh, many, many potential use cases, um, such, such as that uh, data lakes, uh, data needed for websites, mobile applications, some backups, archives. And um, in our case, that could be a data set and CSV file, a, a SAF, SAV file and RDS object. So um, first of all, to connect to AWS from your R console, you will need to have some security credentials. And this is possible to be uh, created once you open a pop-up of your username, go to security credentials, and then you click create the access key. And this is the very same panel where you can actually uh, uh, start the um, multi-factor authentication as well. So that will allow you to be more secure. So not only you will use your username and password, but only an extra authentication thanks to your phone. So just to give you a quick, a quick look. So I would open my security credentials panel. Where I can create new access keys and that would give me the access key ID and a special secret. And this 
access key and secret needs to be put in the R environment file. This is the file that orchestrates the R session and uh, allows you to, to store environmental variable uh, variables. So if you go to R Studio and you put your access key and and uh, secret access key and the default region, uh, because every time you, you work on AWS, you are on a specific specific region. So I am um, currently in the I I am panel, but for more for most of the services, for example, EC2. I will need to pick the, uh, the region that I would like to use. The closer, the closer to, to your location, the better. And we can see that Frankfurt uh, is called EU Central One. So once you have this stored in your R environment file, you can read it with read R environment function. So let's see how does that look in, in R. Um, okay, here we are. So that's our environment file that you can read with our environment function. And uh, uh, this also would be read at the beginning of the session, but this does just double checks that the, that the credentials were read. And those credentials are needed. If you would like to work with S3 from R, you should be able to install aws.s3 package and read our package. So just to let you know, how does it look? How does it look in the console? You can do all the stuff from the from the from the panel, and also you can do all the stuff from from R. So here you can, for example, create a bucket. Bucket is a unique identifier of a folder. So let's see, for example, in this YR webinar example, I already stored a CSV and RDS, and there is another one an example website that I included a website. So S3 stands for data storage, but once you store HTML files, you can also create a website and this can and and this can be a static website container. And uh, let's see how you can access uh, the bucket from from R. So imagine you have any data set like limited iris data set, uh, you would be able to write to S3 by specifying the object, the function that you would like to use when saving, the object name, that's the name on S3, and the bucket, so that's the name of the, of the directory. And you can also save it in the RDS format, then you don't need to specify with which function you would like to save it. So the object could be stored in the RDS extension and that's the bucket. So those, those were executed to create those two objects in the YR webinar example. And uh, there are also functions that allows you to read the data the very same fashion. There is a special function for reading where you can specify which function to use for reading. That's a CSV, but actually that could be read from JSON, uh, read from SAV. So various functions can be provided. And yeah, that would, that, that should work, read CSV not found. Yeah, I need to get the read our package. Righty. So I just uh, loaded uh, data in the CSV format into my R session and also from the RDS. We should be able to see that in here as well. Yes, this is from S3. Okay, so let's call it CSV so we can dis distinguish that there are two. Um, yeah, so this README, the, all the results are populated on GitHub. So if you would follow that from GitHub, those are the very same instructions. So let's skip forward. So I have shown you that you can create a bucket here on 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 the on the side of of amazon you would be able to create a bucket with some name some name example dd um yep so you're able to create a bucket like that but that's a manual work probably the name is taken no it wasn't taken so the bucket was created 
but you can do the same from R. You can, you can put a bucket that's going to create a bucket and you can put any object that doesn't necessarily need to be R object from your version. This can be an, an file from your, from your drive. So if put object, I would be able to put index HTML function into the example website bucket. And there's a special thing that you need to keep in mind that uh, there are metadata of files that are stored. And if you would like to store an HTML, then you would need to, then you would need to, uh, and you would need to specify its content type. So for example, let's make another bucket example website YR2. So that that should be visible from the from the console side. Okay, that's the second bucket. For now, it is empty. We see that nothing is in there. So we would be able to input a file there. So in HTML folder, I have an index file that will be named index on the on the S3 while it's put it there. Okay, we can see that, that should be added here. Yeah, that's the file and its type is HTML. That's 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 crucial because if you wouldn't specify that, uh, it wouldn't be recognized as, a, as an HTML file, but like a binary one that 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 would be downloaded. Alrighty, so the use case here that I'm trying to show is not, not that S3 is needed, only used for uh, data storage, reading and writing, but also it can be used as a, as a container for the static website. So that's what I'm planning to do here. In properties, if you scroll down, you would be able to, you would be able to uh, edit this, uh, option for the static website. Let's enable the option. What's the name of the landing page? It's index HTML and we should have some error HTML file, but that's not needed for this use case. And uh, yeah, that we are almost there. We are almost there. Uh, S3 buckets have their permission schemes so that uh, you can specify whether this should be visible for the, for the public or not. And uh, you can do that with policies. So when looking at the JSON structure, we can see that when specifying a policy for this general use case, where we actually want to make the website visible for the public, we just need to specify the bucket name. So I have updated the policy with the bucket name and I am able to put this policy in, into the bucket. So where it's gonna be put, it's gonna be put here in the bucket policy. Okay, let's refresh the website. And we see that the policy was added here. Lastly, in the properties, we should be able to see the URL of the website that we can open. And now we can see that the website is provided. So there are two use cases for S3. It stands for the storage. We can, put, uh, we can send and get the data once we have credentials and we, we have all the access. And two, if you have a static website, you can also populate it on, on a custom URL. Then you can uh, put the ENS so that this can be also uh, marked, masked by your website. And all the stuff that I am showing is also included in the, on the GitHub. So all the pieces and all the steps are displayed as uh, print screens. So we have created the, the website and now we can go to RDS. So S3 is very basic, but RDS is something that might be more helpful for. So we have seen that you are able to store data 
on S3, but RDS is for re re relational database services. So this is more complex structure that you can host on Amazon. And this is more complex structure that you can connect to. And Amazon makes it easy for you to set it up. So once again, uh, on GitHub, you would be able to see the full procedure, but maybe let me take you through so that we see what steps are taken and what to have in mind when creating a new database. So from the services panel, we can go to RDS. You can create a new database. You can select which engine you would like to use. I'm mostly familiar with PostgreSQL and uh, you can choose types, uh, the size of the of the database. So let me pick the free tier for now. So it's minimal size just for the for the um, for this use case. And this is the place where you name your database. So let's call it example two. And uh, you can also specify the username. So those are the credentials. Okay, someone will be accessing the the database, and what should be the username and the password. So let's make it. Marching, uh, I don't know, stay, um, stay on. Okay, uh, you are also able to provide the instance size. The bigger, the bigger the instance. In typical use cases, the the higher the price. And uh, in the storage, you uh, you can choose how much uh, allocated memory you would like to use, but let's keep it by default. Availability, connectivity, additional connectivity configuration. What's crucial is to make it publicly accessible so it's visible. Um, okay, so there is there's the port uh, under which the database will be, will be um, hosted. And I don't know, there's no preference for me for the availability zone. Additional configuration. All right, and that's also a crucial part. So there's a database name and there's a, um, like the first name that we provided on the top is the name is the name of, uh, of a host, like of the indent identifier. And inside the host, we have, uh, we have a database that has its other name. Okay, I think we are ready to create a database. And here you can see the status that this database is getting created. I also have another database that I created some time ago that is available. Uh, let's see how this created look like and the one that I just, I just made. So the crucial part that you would like to know is the endpoint name. This is the URL that you're gonna call to access the database. And this is the port you're gonna use. And also you need to remember your username and your password. And the crucial part, if, if it's not publicly accessible, you will not be able to get it even though you know all the details. Okay, so this one is still getting created and you don't see the endpoint and the port. And that would take, in my opinion, roughly five minutes. So good, it's good that we have already some example. Uh, crucial part is that this database is created, but there exists something like, uh, like a policy, like security. You have observed that uh, for RDS, we needed to provide a policy that allows this, this, this uh, S3 bucket to be publicly available, available. And here in this case, we will need to uh, specify some rules for the security group that was associated with this with this uh, database. So the moment this is not created yet and it is creating, you cannot actually access any any security group. But here I was able to 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 open security settings. And in this panel for security groups, you are able to take an action and edit inbound, inbound rules that specifies which traffic is allowed for this specific uh, database. And that's 
what and something that was not specified from early beginning is this Postgres uh, type for this specific port and the HTTP type was not specified as well. So let's have a look, maybe it's already created or not. That's, that's example two. This is still getting created. So uh, how would that look like? You would have like empty, empty security group. And what you need to do is you need to add a rule for Postgres. This already knows that uh, it's gonna allow to connect to this board and from which IP addresses. And when you put all the ranges equal to zero, that means all the IP addresses are, are able to <clears throat> connect to this database. And just in case there is a default HTTP traffic on port 80 that I would like to be also accessible from every possible IP, that's what I would create here, HTTP and, uh, and yeah, the last one. Okay, let's not mess it up. Let me just cancel that. Um, but that's how would it how, that's how would it look like. So you need some packages, DBI, that's database interface, R Postgres to actually have the connector to this uh, type of the engine and the dplyr that provides the backend for the data management for this database with the uh, with the dplyr syntax. So once you have all the credentials, let's keep in mind the username, the password, the port, the host that was the endpoint URL, and the name of the database. If you've got all those three and the package is loaded as well, we are able to connect to the, to the database. There's dbi connect function. You specify <laughs> which, which hook should be provided, what's the type of the database, and all the needed uh, credentials like password, port, host, stuff like that okay we are connected we are able to list what library what uh, tables are in there so it, it looks like the iris and the example table are already there um, with the deep layer syntax we are able to copy some new data sets in there so maybe let's get cars to be added there as well Okay, let's see if there is a new table in there. Okay, we've got cars. And uh, what? And uh, let's see what are the column names. There's speed and there's this. And you can do more operations uh, with dplyr when you are connected to the day to the database with the table function you are able to create a hook. So this, this part is different than a regular data frame. You can see that I uh, run a head function, but actually this, is, this isn't a regular table. That, that's just a hook to a database. We see the username and the, and the address, and we can do all the deployer operations thanks to the backend of the player so we can for example also filter just to set also okay that's lowercase or what we can also do we can collect data to actually get it in our r session so yeah iris db was just read so that's the way you can actually work with the database you can put put data there you can read data you can also create uh, tables with the SQL code. So, for example, you can create table in the regular SQL way where you specify the table name, column names, their types, whether they can be null or not, their primary, whether they are primary key, key or not. That's, that's the way that's going to produce an empty table. Okay. Uh, yeah, there was already a table with that name. And the empty table was created. And also there is some approach to insert function that typically works, but 
somehow somehow I can't get rid of the error message today. So this is something that I'm leaving you with as a homework to fix this fix this uh, message so that you also would be able to uh, to insert values into a specific table. All righty, so that is all for the RDS and that is all for the S3. Uh, those are the basics and now we can move to EC2 that stands for uh, computing and that's the crucial part and that's in my opinion the most interesting stuff but if I would start with EC2 you wouldn't pay attention to RDS or neither S3 so I, I left it at the end and uh, once more that just to let you know the stuff that I showed for RDS is all there on GitHub so everything is, is there if you'd like to get it into that later and now let's get to uh, EC2. So that's Elastic Compute Cloud. There's double C, that's why there's two. Uh, in short, it's Amazon EC2. And that's a web service providing resources for resizable computing capacity in the cloud. Oh my, that, 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 sound, that sounds scary, but in the end, this actually allows you to pop up, pop up a small box, do some coding and close it. And you pay, and you pay for the usage. The bigger the machine, the higher the the cost. But there's also a free tier, the small, the small baby size that you can use to um, to just find out whether that that's for you, whether that that's a proper fit or not. So let me just have a look. Let me just introduce you to the EC2 on their pan on their on their panel. So that's what you would see if you would go to the to the console for the EC2 service in the instance running part. You can see that I have already one instance that is running. It's size, that's a free size. Uh, it's ID and its name. It's empty. Okay, that was example one. And you can launch a new instance launch instance, you can select what's the kernel for the instance. <clears throat> so let it be Linux, what's the size? So here you can see that this free version already has one, only has one CPU and one, one gigabyte of RAM. You can pick something bigger, but that's gonna, that's gonna cost. And for the review and launch, you can see that there are there is something called security groups, and as I mentioned before, there are all the restrictions that you need to be aware of, so that you can actually allow some traffic from various uh, various IPs to to the boxes instances that you use. So the moment you edit security groups, you would be able to add a new rule. For example, let's have an HTTP rule, so that the port 80 can be accessed. And in most cases, that's the port that you that you use to export the running service. And as some of you might also be familiar with, but that depends on the user. But uh, sorry, custom. Is there any custom? Mm. I would like to use different different port and then eighty. Nah, how do I do that? Nope. Okay, so you can specify custom port like eighty-seven, eighty-seven. That so that imagine this machine will have a service running on port 80 and then our our studio server running on port 8787 you can review and launch and then you can launch the box and it's go and it's going to ask you okay if you are about to connect over ssh is there any key that you would like to use is there any password that you would like to use and you can create a new one let's create a new key and let's call it 
why our webinar test one two three okay i was able to download it and i can launch the instance and in a sec you will see why this was needed so check out uh, those are the running instances those are created faster than uh, than the rds so one already is running the second one is let me just tell you that this is just linux this is pending and uh, what we need to know to connect to this machine is its public dns so i'm going to copy public dns and how you can get to the machine you can get to the folder where you have stored the key. So this is this is this PEM file. Why are webinar test one two three? So this file is uh, associated with the machine, and now we can SSH into the machine while specifying the name of this PEM file and the default username, which is Ubuntu. Oh, maybe the name isn't copied properly. Let me try again. Da, da, da. EC2 Hey, let's see. Hmm. Okay, maybe we will be able to connect to the machine that I started some time ago. So like this one, example one. Let's see. Hmm. What are the PEM files here? The other PEM file is YR webinar test. Okay. Alrighty. Um, yeah, maybe it's not. Oh, yeah, I can tell it is still initializing. Sorry, guys, I was uh, distracted by the state that it's running, but actually it's initializing. So the second machine is not ready yet, but the first one is ready. So here I am just logged to this machine and we can see that there are some files we can see in which directory we we are running and what are the usernames here so there is our studio user shiny and or ubuntu so this is just the raw machine it 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 it, it uh the, the one that i would like to actually connect that is still initializing that would be an empty machine it, this doesn't have any useful software and as an r user we would actually like to have some useful r software which is in our case uh shiny shiny servers or our studio servers so once again to sum it up the second machine that i was trying to start and is still initializing is an empty one and it wouldn't have any software and the first one that i started is actually the one that already has some specification so how to how to start up a machine that is already a bit predefined it has some r packages and it has r studio server already running so there is uh louis aslet that created some uh saved instances that can be run so from his website you can see that for various regions you can start a machine that is already pre-configured and has our studio server in there so for example we would be able to start a specific instance that was stored. 
and we would go through the very same through the very same path. There is there is an instance. Uh, there is there is the very same path. The instance is already predefined. I can uh, select what should be the size. I can select the security group. Okay, edit security groups. I would like to add um, some traffic for port 80, some traffic for port 87, so that some stuff can be actually there. I can review and launch, launch. I can choose an existing key bar. So that's that's a, that's a stuff that I'm using to SSH from the from the bash terminal. Okay, let's use this one. And let's view instances. So that's what I have shown you right now is the shiny, sorry, RStudio server example. RStudio server. So this will take some time to actually get initialized. Uh, so this is the Linux example that is empty. This is the stuff that I promise has RStudio server in it. And this is the example that I have run uh, some time ago today. And it already has uh, the RStudio server in there. So when I pick when I pick this instance, I would be able to open it public IP address. And this was predefined in the way that under the port 80, RStudio server is running. The username is RStudio because that's the default RStudio box. However, the password is no longer RStudio so that it's not that easy to get hack. The password is the instance ID. And uh, yeah, you can see that uh, on this board, we are running we are running uh, um, uh, our studio server with our version 402. We can create a new project. We have we have some R capabilities, so you would be able to actually create a new project from a version control from the Git, so that you can copy your code, clone it, run some computations, and when you when you feel you're done. You can go to the AMI, uh, to the to the EC2 panel, and you can say, "Okay, I no longer need Linux instance, so I can uh, in the instance settings, instance state, I can stop it for the future usage, or I can completely terminate it because I think it's no longer gonna make any use." Okay, so this one is sharing. Uh, this one with the R Studio server example hasn't started yet, but we have observed that uh, the one that I started like an hour ago uh, had was 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 really successful. So, getting back to GitHub, I'm almost done. Just to make a small summary, so uh, in this video. Uh, I presented you AWS capabilities for free potential useful uh, services, S3 for data storage, RDS for re relational database storage, and EC2 for um, cloud computing. I have shown you how to create a user and how to properly log, how to use the management console. You know that there are uh, documentations for every of the services on S3 you should be aware that you need to have credentials that you are able to also have the multi-factor authentication that credentials needs to be stored in the R environment file that can be re read at any point of the session. You need to have specific packages to actually read and write objects to S3. You can also create buckets from your local session. Uh, you, can, you can create a website on S3 uh, after you put an object and uh, then you allow a specific policy and you allow in the properties for that bucket to provide static website hosting. For the RDS, 
We have observed that few our packages are very useful. We know how to create a database uh, for, a, for a Postgres engine. We know that the crucial part is the name password and that it needs to be pub publicly available. Um, yeah, and I have also listed listed uh, the process of, of um, allowing specific traffic to be uh, provided on, on specific ports on which the host runs the database. And uh, yeah, with all those stuff, you're able to connect to the database, you're able to write write uh, write objects to the database you're able to read objects into the database you're also able to use regular sql and for the ec2 i have shown you how to start an empty machine that just contains linux or how to start machines that are predefined and uh, have and have uh, and have our studio server inside so yeah i think that's that's all from my side and uh, i i'm Hoping there's at least one question on, on the chat, or maybe Christopher, you have any question that we, we can talk about. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Martin, for the presentation. Uh, that, was, that was really cool stuff. Um, yeah, I, I have few, there are a few questions from the chat box and I'm just going to ask um, them to you. So probably I can do two, two questions at a time, or you, you prefer one at a time. Uh, let's do one at one at a time. One at a time. Okay. Okay. Fine. So, um, so, uh, so there's one question. Uh, uh, one of the um, uh, listeners uh, wanting to know whether whether you pay for the security keys. So, do you do you get charged for the security keys? Uh, you don't get charged for security keys. Okay. Okay. You don't. Okay. Great. So and um, so. Kabede also wants to know whether whether you recommend using um, using 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 AWS from um, our studio, the local, the desktop, the desktop our studio, or you can use it from the our studio server by accessing it via the domain system uh, domain name system you are in the AWS. So, which one is more easier? Is it using using it from the our studio desktop or using it from the our studio server using the DNS? The connection to, the connection to RDS. Yes. Um, I think that depends on the use case. Sometimes you just want to uh, play locally. You don't have a big need for computations and you can use your local computer. And uh, then you connect to the RDS. However, in my opinion, the connection is longer uh, than when you are actually on EC2. Somehow the wires are more connected when you are calling it from EC2. So that's, that's actually faster. And from the other hand, when you need heavy, heavily computations and you are on EC2, that's still possible to connect to RDS. So that depends on the use case and, and the machine that you need. But from my experience, uh, I can tell that the connection is faster, faster on EC2. And that, that's the same for S3. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so the third question is, um, so uh, uh, Michal wants to know if, um, can you start the, uh, the Amazon Nest services uh, instance from your R environment file. So like automatically at startup, the R environment starts up the instance for AWS. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So check out, I'm gonna share the screen. That's actually very advanced and I thought that's gonna be boring, but uh, yeah, you can, you can check run instances function from AWS EC2 and that allows you to 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 run uh, to run instances and uh, yeah what you need to specify are those uh, ids of stopped of stopped uh, of stopped instances or uh, ids of amis and the ami is for example an instance that is stored and shared so with run instances you would be able to actually start an AMI, that's that's a stored that's a stored uh, instance, and you can also specify the type. So that's for the size, um, the keeper. Uh, that's this uh, that's this PEM file that you need to have to connect, uh, that you would like to use. And there's there are also security groups that you might use. So uh, in the so in the panel, you can always go to security groups 
and you can predefine security groups so that you don't need to specify them every single time. You can have one security group with all the specification there and you can pass it with run instances. So actually what's easier in my opinion, but that requires an advanced usage is that you run this uh, from the R console and you have all the, all the specification um, because in most cases this, in most cases you would like to use the very same image with, uh, with the same security group. So that's possible from R and in my opinion, that's even more convenient. Well, okay, so thank you. So um, the next question is uh, quite interesting. So uh, Igor wants to know why you prefer AWS over Google or Microsoft solutions. I knew, I knew that's coming. Uh, I don't have any preference. This is just a stack that I started using and I was I, and I wasn't ever dissatisfied. So in my opinion, this is the same as for the language, for programming language. When somehow you start with Python or somehow you, were, you, were, you learned R in the school, that's the primary tool that you use um, at the beginning of your journey. So AWS is the first service that I started to, to, to be using. And to be honest, I see that many possibilities that I no longer want to move away, but I just rather want to know more more possible um, options for that. And I don't have any experience with other platforms, so I can't really compare. Okay, okay, yeah, so. Well, I think uh, I saw Ivo, I hope you have your answer there. So then um, Lucas want to know whether you've tried running R as a custom engine for AWS Lambda, so that is not keeping EC2 running all the time. Oh, wow. Wow, that's 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 a very advanced question. So yeah, there are many possibilities. The the lambda uh, functions, as I understand, allows you to actually react to some triggers and some events and to run other actions. So that there are possibilities that, for example, lambda will trigger a machine that will run a specific script, and then it will close down after the script is done. And yeah, that's possible. But uh, as a data scientist. Um, I'm not involved in such pi pipelines, uh, rather, rather I'm a statistician, so I do a data analysis and I need to have like heavy, heavy model running. Then I start the machine, run it on my own and then close it after the results are sold, stored. So in my opinion, the, the Lambda is very useful, but not for my use case where I just need to run it from a time to time. And there isn't a pipeline that is uh, that is required and needs to be automated and uh, needs to have those triggers. Okay, great. Uh, so the next question, uh, Martin, is um, so uh, so when using Amazon Redshift, so uh, do you work do you work on it directly or through other services? So that's a question from Carol. So she mm -hmm. wants to, wants to know whether when working with Amazon Redshift, so do you work on it directly or use other services? Mm, Redshift, as I understand, that's a distribution. That's the distribution of uh, Linux. And uh, as I understand the question, so that's something that you can have. That is that is actually here. So from instances, you can launch a new instance. And here you can select uh, what would you like to run so you can have Windows as a kernel, or you can have uh, Ubuntu and whether well, there's a Redshift, right? No, there isn't, there's Red Hat. So for this Redshift, I think I have missed the question. So, sorry, I don't think I, I get the question. Okay, maybe, maybe Carol, uh, you can use the link uh, under the video description, uh, the Zoom link for uh, after the after the webinar, so maybe you could talk one on one with the machine so that uh, you can get your uh, response uh, clarified. Okay, so uh, oh. then oh oh wait, wait, wait Christopher maybe that's the what maybe that's the database. No, I don't see. Okay, okay. no idea. Okay, okay, uh, fine. So I think. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe the Zoom link will help. Maybe you can have one-on-one -on -one talk with the uh, with the Carol so that you can clarify or clarify the question to you. Oh, great. So, uh, so the other question, uh, 
has been answered by one uh, one of the also the attendees and uh, maybe I'll just I'll still ask it to you. <laughs> so the question goes: uh, Could you host shiny apps on uh, AWS? Yeah, yeah. So you can you can you can run you can run uh, a machine, and on this machine, I have showed that we were able to set up uh, our studio server. So you can also set up shiny server and uh, put applications in there, allow security groups to open some ports that are, uh, that are open for the public traffic. And the very same way you can have our studio server, that's the very same way you can have Shiny server. And that's the very same way you can have any other service besides those two, like, like, like anything. Okay, so, uh, so I want to ask, uh... Sorry, I want to ask uh, maybe a question of my own, uh, just on the line of uh, hosting um, uh, shiny apps on uh, on the AWS. So, since uh, a complete a complete shiny app includes um, includes uh, data, maybe data set that you not you not want to share with a third party or something. So, how secure mm -hmm. is the environment when you are deploying the shiny apps to 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 it? Like, mm -hmm. how, how secure? How confident am I? Uh, hosting my shiny apps uh, with my data sets and everything on, on AWS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So um, the, 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 in my opinion, there's the same security as for a regular shiny app. So if there's a way to hack shiny app so that you can extract the data that it's in the shiny app, then, then that's the very same case, the very same case as for shiny apps. But uh, if Shiny doesn't allow you to extract the data that it is using, then there's no way to actually get uh, get into into the into the file. Uh, and that that's my experience. But I don't I don't have uh, deeper deeper expertise in that field. So in my opinion, the data that is stored is like uh, stored as a as a file, and it's really hard to get there if you don't know the key pair. And uh, if the, yeah, so I think that that's not possible to actually get into the data other than hacking the actual uh, shiny session. And I have no knowledge how you could do that. Oh, okay, great. So I think uh, a similar question from uh, JM, um, uh, still on the security. So you wondering how secure is the set setting that you've just showed us. So how, how secure is the, 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 the setting on AWS? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to to actually get to the EC2 from uh, from the terminal, you need to have my file, my PEM file, the one that I use to SSH. If you don't have the file, you're not gonna log. And uh, to get to the shiny, to get to the sorry to the R Studio server, you have seen that you need to know at least the username R Studio. That's easy, and the instance ID. To get the instance ID, you would need to know the credentials to log. And even though you know the even even though you know the instance ID and you are able to log to the R Studio server, uh, I don't think this user name, which is R Studio, there has has huge privileges. In my opinion, that's that's a very basic uh, user. So even though you would be able to get through the R Studio server in your browser. I don't think that user can do a lot in terms of uh, deleting or getting getting the stuff. Uh, probably you would be able to download everything that is in uh, our studio users directory. Okay. So that's pretty that's pretty secure if you don't know the if, if you don't know the pem the pem file and if you don't know the instance ID. That that looks pretty secure. That's secure. Oh. Okay. Uh, quite, and you quite... can also block the traffic to specific IPs, so you can only allow your IP or your company's IP, and no one outside this IP will connect. Will will get you. I just showed you the security the security uh, structure that allows all the traffic to get to this uh, to this instance. But from the other hand, you could limit that to specific IPs. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so Conrad, uh, so Conrad's uh, question. Um, uh, um, so he was wondering whether, so when when he wants to run, say a web crawler for a couple of hours, uh, so in a day. So how could they how could they avoid running EC2 24/7? I think a similar question like the one I posted earlier. So 
say they wanted to run a web crawler for a couple of day, uh, a couple of hours a day. How could they avoid running the EC2 uh, maybe 24/7, like all the time? Mm -hmm. You can have the machine just be opened all over the time. Uh, you can open it and close it manually. So you can uh, start your day, go to the management console, start the instance, start the script, close it at the end of the day, or from R, or actually from. <clears throat> Let me share the screen. What? So actually from, from R, you would be able to use EC2 to run the instance and, and then you can actually also autom automatically SSH into the instance and run the script. So sky is the limit. You can do that. You can do that manually. There's also a package that allows you to start it and stop it. Um, yeah, so um, from the other hand, the crawlers doesn't need a lot of a lot of RAM, so I would start them on uh, very basic instances that are quite cheap. It's like two dollars a day or a dollar a day, so I wouldn't actually mind running a, a crawler that doesn't need a lot of RAM for a week. That would in the end be probably twenty dollars for you. But you can limit, but you can limit the expenses by opening the console, stopping the instance on your own if you don't need it but I can imagine the crawler rather works every second or every minute or every hour. So yeah, the typical use case for the crawler would be like, okay, have it for a week, get the smallest possible instance. Oh, okay, oh, thank you. So um, last but not least, uh, Martin, uh, so how do you deploy models uh, with AWS, uh, for instance, as a plumb API or any other, any other way? So that's a question from Lucas. Oh my, that's a different story. That's 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 a different story, actually. Um, yeah, so there's another system. Let me show you that. So that is that is very advanced question to be to be honest. Yep. So there is uh, the SageMaker. There's the SageMaker that uh, that is that is that is uh, the, the advanced use case. Uh, here in the SageMaker, you would be able to start a small Jupyter notebook, and with this Jupyter notebook, you would be able to train a machine learning algorithm, and you would be able to store machine learning algorithm, and you would be able to create an endpoint that allows you to use this uh, that allows you to use this machine learning model, and uh, this is very um, independent environment that through the Jupyter notebook allows you to run uh, some code. And in most cases, the code is containerized with Docker containers. So to sum up, you would be able to run some code here, but that actually would be a Docker container that has a code to train the model. This model will be stored. This Docker container is also responsible for uh, setting up the API once the model is created. This model needs to be created and stored here, and the specific endpoint needs to be provided for this for, for this model so that it can be uh, allowed for the public usage. So that in the end, when someone calls the endpoint stored on the SageMaker, uh, it uses your model specification and the Docker container connected to the model so that the API is run inside the Docker container and the prediction is made for this model. So this is very advanced topic and I think that we will need another hour to go through that. Thank you. So uh, the last question, uh, Machin, um, Katie, so I think at some point in the presentation you you, you showed some posters. So Katie, wa, Katie would love to know what does the poster say? I think it was, it was, it was a bit clear, so yeah. I don't know if you'll be kind enough to. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I think at some point the procedure there was some, some image like poster, you, mm -hmm. you you showed. So Katie would love to know what 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 does what 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 is contained in that small image. <laughs> I don't I don't know which poster we are talking, but uh, maybe on this GitHub repo there's some more. <laughs> Yeah, so 
yeah for the posters i can imagine that's that's me presenting the the video you can you can click it to see the video after that's why our foundation that actually uh, i am representing we are our our group um that supports other other our groups we do we do hackathons and conferences and the other poster that i see could be this map where we present all the meetings that you, that we organized or co-organized during the last four years and i can't can't imagine is there any other poster but uh but yeah uh if you go to if you go to our our webinar you can see that you can see that there is a Zoom URL, and if you'd like to chat a little bit more, let's just meet on on the Zoom URL after the, after the after the stream. Well, uh, excellent. Thank you, Machin. That was a great presentation. Uh, there are no more questions in the chat box, and uh, uh, so for the for the uh, attendees of the webinar, so I'll still uh, again. Uh, say that there's a zoom uh, just below the the, the, the streaming video the description uh, that you can actually click and uh, after the webinar is done you can be able to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, talk with the, the the presenter if you have more questions to ask or you want any clarification to be made so thank you everyone thank you all for uh, getting time to attend this today's webinar and uh, yeah, it was nice. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. It was really excellent. Okay. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Christopher, for hosting. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, hope to see.